So this is the 41st Caller Lab convention, and we are in Reno, well, just outside of Reno in Sparks, Nevada. Today, I believe, is the 14th of April. Okay, everybody said yes. And uh, my name is Susan Healy. Um, you may be aware that I am not a score dance caller. I would be the other half of the team. I'm a round dance cure. Please do not hold that against me. Okay? <laughs> All right. Just to let you know a little bit, I was a practicing audiologist for 30 years, and I just recently finished that career. And I'm changing into my second career, which will be the executive administrator of Roundelab. And so that is really exciting for me. I've been score dancing and round dancing since 1970. And actually, I took score dance lessons before I was born. My mother was pregnant when she took score dance lessons, so I grew up in the activity. It's part of me. And I've been queuing since 1986. So today, the name of the session is, What Did I Say? And we're going to talk about a variety of things that have to do with hearing impairment and communicating with dancers. I will say I have a full presentation. I will try to take questions at the end, but please hold your questions. We're a little late starting, so hopefully I'll get to the questions. I have to start with a disclaimer. And my disclaimer is, my sense of humor is not my fault. It comes from the volcanic gases in the water I drink. For those of you that don't know, Longview, Washington comes right off of Mount St. Helens, and the river flows right down. And for years, until about a year ago, they took our drinking water right out of the river. So it's not my fault, OK? What is an audiologist? There may be someone in this room that does not know the answer to that. An audiologist is a person who holds a degree and or certification in hearing sciences and whose specific interest is in the identification, measurement, and rehabilitation of persons with hearing impairments. An audiologist may or may not dispense hearing aids, and I did for the entire 30 years. I also dispensed a lot of hearing enhancement systems, and we'll talk about that much later. What is a round dance instructor, according to Susan? That would be a person who spends a great deal of time telling people what to do and where to go. Think about it. That's what we do. We're on the stage. We tell the people what to do next, where to go next. Um, could that also apply to the definition of a square dance caller? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. But the key here is we tell them what to do. So there are three primary modes of communication and dancing, and these are the primary ones. Touch, visual, and auditory. And I want to talk a little bit about touch. How do we communicate with the dancers, or how do the dancers communicate through touch? You have the feel of your own body in space and with the floor. Now, this is while you're dancing. If you think about that, you, unless your feet are numb, you have the feel of the floor and where we are in space. So that's a touch factor. We have contact with others in the square. Another touch factor. We have a partner who leads us. We're all aware of the caller saying, you know, heads promenade half, and one of the couples stands there for a moment until the partner leads them and says, let's go. So there was a touch factor there. Other dancers may gently lead or do through touch as well. So there's communication inside that square through touch, as well as how we know where we are in space through touch. 
visual. That was the second way of communicating. We watch other dancers. You've probably all stood on the stage and watched somebody in the square who was obviously watching the other dancers in the square to know how to do things, even if they possibly knew the figure, but they weren't sure what the caller said. You watch a demonstration on teaching, uh, the teaches. And I'm going to pick on the score dance callers for just a moment. I really have not understood in all of my years of dancing why the round dance teachers primarily teach visually. We go out in the middle of the floor and show the figure over and over and over and talk about it. And in general, a lot of score dance callers just stand on the stage and talk. And I, over the years, have asked some callers about that, and some of them have started incorporating more visual teaching, where they will either get, get part of a square to demonstrate something, or if it's just a two-person event they, with their partner or whatever, they will demonstrate the figure. And that often helps the visual learners. We communicate through others' facial expressions, if you start to do the wrong figure in a square, someone may look at you really surprised or in an unusual way. So there's communication there. The caller or cueer, I threw that in there, has body language and their visual cues of what they're doing, not the grand dance cues, but the cues of what we should be doing. You're communicating. You're communicating whether you have enthusiasm on the stage or whether you really didn't want to be there that night because you had a headache. There's communication. Lip reading. Whether you believe it or not, you have people on the floor, especially if they're up fairly close to you, that may be watching your lips and helping. And it, that does make a difference. For all of you who think that you don't lip read, let me talk a little bit about how did you learn how to talk when you were about a year old. You watched somebody. That was one of the ways is the mimic and the watching. And we learn how to lip read then. And we keep that skill. We don't realize it. Much later, you may go back and start to use it more and realize that you're using it more. But it's helpful if the caller is at least talking out to the crowd and not turned, and I'm guilty too, you know, I'm bringing up my next piece of music on my computer and it's over here and I'm still talking to my dancers during lessons and those kinds of places. So the third one was auditory. Oh, isn't that why we're here today? Oh, my. The dancers hear the music and they understand the commands. That was it. All the rest of them, we had multiple things that I said through touch, we did it multiple ways. And through visual, we did it multiple ways. Auditory, you get one shot. And the only second shot would be if the somebody repeats it for them in the square. And I'm sure we've all been in squares where they did that. You know, you had somebody telling one of the dancers what the caller had just said. So I want to stop for just a moment and talk about equilibrium because that goes with the ear, and I'll explain that in a minute. But those three modes of communication that I just talked about are also used in your equilibrium. All three senses. Touch, where we are in space. Vision where we are in space, and the balance side of the inner ear. Not the hearing side, but the balance side of the inner ear. So if you have someone who has a compromised system, and they don't have one of those three senses, or it's compromised somewhat, they're probably still doing okay in most situations. But if you take two of those away, then they're only relying on one of them, or you're not, you're compromising it along the way. So consequently, if you have someone who maybe they have some neuropathy and, and they don't feel 
things quite as well as they used to with their nervous system. And maybe they're having a little bit of trouble hearing. And then you take part of their vision away. On top of it, it can make them dizzy. And why am I talking to you about that? Once again, round dance leaders are probably worse, but we like to have ambience. We like to turn down the lights sometimes and have a little bit of mood at our dance. And you may have a dancer on the floor that that just throws them off, absolutely throws them off. So I'm very bad as a round dance cuer. If I come in and the lights are all turned down and it's time to dance, I turn up those lights so that I can do pivots and spins and whatever for the dancers and hopefully they'll be able to keep the equilibrium as well. Because if you lose your equilibrium, you're done for the night in a lot of ways. So I just wanted to relate that because audiologists also do a lot of work in the equilibrium side of things. End of that section. Well, as soon as it goes to the next one. So, during a square dance tip. We've already talked about this. The primary mode of communication between the caller and the dancers is auditory. That's the primary mode there. As score dance leaders, we should focus on our auditory communication with the dancers and assure it is the highest quality possible at all times. So let's talk a little bit about things other than hearing, per se. What things can affect your hearing? And notice that that's in quotation marks. Cognitive issues. Whether or not you actually processed the sound. It makes a huge difference. Whether or not you, quote, heard it. Your emotional state especially nervousness. If somebody is nervous, they tend not to hear things. And they may actually think they didn't hear it, truly. Um, you have a session a little bit later on about competition and dancing. And I was the chief round dance judge for the Pacific Northwest Teen Festival for a couple of years. And they have something called hash, where they put it on and the couples have to dance it and every couple dances the same thing. We bring them in one at a time in this particular category. The sound is set before we start. This particular category had five couples in it. The third couple came on and they didn't do overly well. And the coach came up to me immediately and protested because she said that the girl didn't hear. She couldn't hear. And I said, the sound was set before the first couple. I can't touch it. You know that. And the coach looked at me, winked, and said, I know that. The coach knew what was happening. The girl was so nervous, she didn't hear the cues. She was that nervous. You get new dancers, especially the first night. They're really nervous. They don't know what's going on. It will affect their ability to, quote, hear. How interested are you in the topic? It makes a difference whether or not you heard it, per se. And then, whether or not the speaker makes it interesting. You may really want to know about this, but it is such a dull presentation, you don't care. So, that's a whole another another side of things. Fatigue. Somebody's worked a 12-hour shift. They've been really busy all day. They may or may not have gotten a lot to eat. I don't think I put that on here. They're tired. They don't hear quite as well. Physical pain, not feeling well, that makes a difference. Influence of drugs and alcohol. We may not think about it, but we have dancers out there who are under the influence of drugs and alcohol and or alcohol. Some of them may be prescription medications, especially as our rising population and age. Central auditory processing. I want to talk about that for a minute because 
we don't know about that necessarily. It's not well publicized. Most of you have probably heard of dyslexia, the reading disorder where you get um, letters backwards and you have trouble reading that way. In auditory communication, and I'll talk about the nerve in a moment, the way that I explain this to parents when I diagnose it is if we had a freeway and we had four lanes going up the freeway and everybody stayed in their own lane, everything would be just fine. We would all arrive at our end point and everything would be great. But if you have a processing problem in your ear or nerve, what happens is those people start changing lanes going up that freeway and they just kind of do it haphazardly in the nerve and pretty soon we have all these collisions. And pretty soon we get up there, not everybody got to the end point. Not only that, but the ones that did, their car doesn't look as nice as it did when they started. And we have all of these fender benders going up there. So the information doesn't get there. We may send it to the dancer, but what they perceive may be somewhat different. And you cannot tell by looking at someone whether or not they have an auditory processing problem which is different than whether or not they heard the tone. A big difference that way. Then, all of a sudden, at the bottom of the slide, let's talk about hearing loss or hearing. So I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. According to the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, 36 to 38 million Americans have hearing loss. That's a lot. One out of five people who could benefit from amplification actually wears a hearing aid. 20% of the people who could benefit from amplification actually wear a hearing aid. 80% of the people who could benefit from amplification do not wear a hearing aid. <laughs> Men are more apt to experience hearing loss than women, and I think that was just from the fact that we still have a few more men in industry than women. I think as we get more and more equal in our jobs and when, when you've been around noise that will even out more. I don't think that's a real gender difference. That's more an occupational difference. Approximately 25% of a million, 25 million Americans experience tinnitus or tinnitus. Whichever way you want to pronounce it, they're both right depending upon which part of the country you're from. I want to talk about that for just a moment because I will invariably sometime after I do this session somebody will come up to me and say you know I could hear just fine if I didn't have this ringing in my ear. Tinnitus or tinnitus means sound in head or ear unless it's a little voice talking to you. That's a different problem. <laughs> okay? <laughs> So, <laughs> anyway, having that does not actually make a difference in whether or not you hear as far as physically hearing the sound. We can prove it. We can test people on days that they have bad tinnitus, days they don't have any tinnitus, sometimes it fluctuates, and their hearing loss will be identical. What it does sometimes, remember I went back to attention span, whether or not your attention was on what was going on, whether or not it makes you tired, all of those things. But it will not affect the physical hearing. So there's a little bit of difference there. Our population, we've already referred to this. The average age of score dancers is continuing to increase. More than half of people over age 50 have a hearing loss significant enough to impact their understanding of speech, especially in a background of noise. So you have a square, and 
let's say that you're out somewhere where, you know, the average age in your club is 50, 55, maybe 60. I'm not talking about the 85-year-olds. The percentages go way up of hearing loss. But just 50 and over, half of your square will have some enough hearing loss to make it difficult to hear. 80% of those will not wear a hearing aid. So you don't know by looking at somebody whether or not they're having trouble hearing. You can't tell when they walk in. It's kind of like you can't tell when they walk in the door what level they square dance, whether it's mainstream plus, whatever. You can't tell by looking at them. So signs of hearing loss in adults, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. You frequently complain that people mumble, speech is not clear, or you hear only parts of conversations when people are talking. You often ask people to repeat what they said. Your friends or relatives tell you that you don't seem to hear very well. Some of you might have relatives that are saying that, huh? You do not laugh at jokes because you miss too much of the story. You need to ask others about the details of a meeting that you just attended. <laughs> others say that you play the TV or radio too loudly. You cannot hear the doorbell or the telephone ring. You find that looking at people when they talk to you makes it somewhat easier to understand, especially when you're in a noisy place or where there are competing conversations, which is right back to the lip reading that I talked about. We just get better at it sometimes as we get older. We never lose that ability. So I just want to mention these. These are the three rules of auditory communication, and they're probably all kinds of communication, not just auditory, but sort of. Uh, oh, this was per Susan, by the way. Husbands don't listen. Mm-hmm. Wives mumble. And... Singles smile a lot, particularly if you have two singles who are not dating. They're coming from two different places. They're coming to the dance and dancing together as partners. You know, they smile a lot. They put up with a lot because they want to keep that partner. Trust me, I'm single. I smile a lot sometimes. And it's just the way that it goes. That's more of a joke type thing, but do be aware of it. So... This is the exciting part. It's all about the human ear. What happens is we have sound that comes in from outside, and it comes down the ear canal. The ear canal is about an inch to an inch and a quarter in length. And then it goes through the eardrum, through the three little bones that are in there, goes in this area, and there are thousands of little nerve endings in there to pick up the sound, and they're tuned to different pitches. And that sends the sound up the nerve to the brain up here. This part was that equilibrium system that I talked about. And there are three sets of canals, is what we call them, in there. One are vertical, one are horizontal, one's in between. And depending upon where the fluid is in those canals, is helping tell me where I am in, sa in the space as I move back and forth, if I put my head up and down, that type of thing. So it just gives you an idea. So this gold part is the outer ear. The kind of reddish pink part is the middle ear. And this is the inner ear and the nerve. Just briefly, oh, that's right. First we have to talk about the brain. This, you will notice, would be the left side of the brain. And this little part, because I know you can't read it very well, this little part has to do with hearing, and this little part has to do with auditory processing. Those two little parts is all we get. The rest of the brain is for other things. So if we go back to the outer ear, we find that wax buildup can cause hearing loss. 
we find that you can have a physical obstruction. You put an earplug in your ear. If you put an earplug in your ear, it causes your hearing to go down. And it's pretty good at causing it to go down fairly equally across pitches. And it just kind of dampens things. That's important. You could put other things in your ear. I worked for ear, nose, and throat doctors for 30 years. You wouldn't believe what people had in their ears, especially little kids. Rocks, jelly beans, etc. <laughs> you can have an anatomical anatomy where it just didn't form all the way. And that will happen occasionally. Then in the middle part of the ear, behind the eardrum, we can actually have a perforation or a hole in the eardrum, which will make a difference in how it vibrates. Because it's just like the top of a drum. It just vibrates that way. You can have scarring on the eardrum. If somebody's had a lot of ear infections, as they heal, that eardrum will get thicker and it scars and it doesn't let the sound go through as well. But you still basically just have a drop in loudness. You can have fluid behind the ear. If you, you know, if you know anybody that you know says, oh, you know, my ear's full, is plugged up, I've got fluid behind it, the doctor said I had fluid behind it, or you have a grandchild who has fluid behind their ear, this is where that's going to happen, is in that cavity and not allowing it to move right. You can have a problem with the bones. They can be calcified together. Disarticulation simply means that they broke apart. So those things can happen. The inner ear, age is number one reason for having hearing loss in the inner ear. Number two is noise exposure. The rest of them are not in any particular order. Diseases of the inner ear, and there are a lot of those out there. We have toxicity, ototoxicity just means toxic to the ear, O-T-O stands for ear. Uh, from medications, drugs. Some of you are not going to like it when I say smoking. It can cause hearing loss. That's not well known. It's, it's very well known. It's not well publicized is the better way to say that. Infections. A blood supply. Somebody has a stroke. Remember, it only affected a little bit of the brain you know, where we have, so you can have stroke up there, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But you can also have stroke that causes a problem with the blood supply into the inner ear. So if you have a dancer who had a light stroke, and then they come back to dancing, and they're not comprehending as well, as well. some of it may be cognitive, but some of it could be hearing loss, could be new hearing loss. You don't know how many times I tested people where that was the case. And usually, unfortunately, there's not a lot they can do about it. But I'm not a doctor. I'm an audiologist. Send them to their doctor. And then we have the wonderful unknown. We don't know what caused the problem. We just know it's there. And that happens a lot. You will notice when I get up to the nerve brain part, I didn't talk about age, but it should have been there. We still have diseases. We still have toxicity. We still have infections. Oh, my, we can't tell the difference where it happened, can we? We have the blood supply, tumors. If you have a tumor on the nerve of the ear, it's almost always benign. If you have it up in the brain, it can be most anything. But if you have a brain tumor that's right in that area or affecting the blood supply into that area, it can make a huge difference. Then it's hard to know sometimes cognition versus hearing. And once again, always finish all slides with unknown. So I do want to talk a little bit about sound because that makes a difference. I'm not going to actually talk about how to sound the hall. I did that at Ramda Lab this year. But we have, you look at the sound wave, that's how we graph it. Sound is air pressure changes. And so we have our little speaker unit, and what has happened is all of those little molecules of air have gotten really close together. 
And we graph that as the top of the peak. That's just our choice to do that. That was a relative decision by somebody whenever. And we call that compression. And then when it comes down, we have more space between the molecules in the air. And at the bottom, we call that rarefaction. And what I really just want to show you here is that we have the sinusoidal wave and the ear was on the other side. If you'd like the other presentation someday, that may be possible. Frequency, the pitch of the sound. If we have high treble sounds, those little sinusoidal waves are really close together. As we come down in we get uh, more space between them as you get closer to the base end. Down here at the base end, there's a lot more space between them. So consequently, if you have a lot of different sounds together, you don't have just this really pretty, nice waveform. But I want you to get a concept for that because we work with those waveforms, or at least a lot of us do. Intensity means loudness. So if it's quieter, we don't graph it as big or as high. And if we have more amplitude, it's louder. It's pretty simple. Most of you probably already knew that. I just wanted to review it. Sound is measured in decibels. The decibel scale is not linear. It is logarithmic, just like the earthquake scale. So most of us realize that a 7.4 earthquake is much greater than a 7.0 earthquake. But we don't always think about that in sound, and it's true. There are several different decibel scales. There really are. Mostly it's their starting points. For this session, and as an audiologist, because I'm talking about the perception of the human ear, I like to use the one where zero is described as a sound barely audible to the human ear. From that starting point, a sound that is 10 times more powerful than zero decibels is described as 10 decibels. Okay, that's pretty easy to understand. I go up 10, 10 times, I get 10 decibels. But a sound that is 100 times more powerful is 20 decibels. A sound that is 1,000 times more powerful is 30 decibels. It makes a difference. Let's look at it a little bit differently. In general, we agree in the scientific world that most humans will perceive a doubling of the sound loudness when the sound is increased by three decibels. That's your perception of the sound. It's not how much power we're putting into the output. That's how we, we perceive it as being twice as loud if we increase it by three decibels. So we have a sound over here, and, we, and it's a nice little circle. I'm just not very good with a pointer. That's 83 decibels. And we take it up 3 decibels to 86. You see the difference in the size of the circles between those two? We go again to 89. We're only going up another 3 decibels. Look at the size of the circle, especially compared here. Now we go to 92 decibels, and we've got this great big circle. We have nine decibels between here and here. That's all the difference that there is. And why do we care about that as square dance callers? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I do an awful lot of computer editing of music. And probably most of your square dance label stuff probably comes in pretty solid across, is my guess. Okay. Okay. And the pop label stuff, and I know more and more and more of you are using that, especially for pattern music, will go up and down and do all kinds of fun stuff. 
So it does make a difference, and we're going to show that in a second. Music editing for the loudness. Once again, this is basically what I have just said. If there's a difference of 3 dB or more, that could be twice as loud to that music. So you may want to go into that spectrograph, that graphing of the music, and be able to change it and make it a little more even. So this is what came in to me from Amazon.com on a piece of music. And it's not as tall here. And then it gets taller. So consequently, it's louder here. And then it gets quieter. And then it's louder again. So we can see all those sinusoidal waves that are all put together because we have lots of different pitches in there. But you can see the difference in the loudness. Then we go in and whichever way I chose to do it, it doesn't really matter whether I went in and highlighted this section and made it louder and this section and made it louder or whether I made these softer and then made them all louder. It doesn't matter. The concept is I evened it out somewhat. And we're right back to that original piece because that's a duplicate slide. The point is if you're in editing music, and it says that, you know, this part can only go up or can't go up at all. Let's say it can't go up at all. And this part next to it can go up three decibels. And we look at that and we go, well, that's not very much. Three's not very much, is it? It's twice as loud. So it's going to be twice the difference when you're running it through that PA system. So hopefully that will help. I want to talk a little bit about an audiogram. If you go to your favorite audiologist, and you all have a favorite audiologist, do you not? Am I now your favorite audiologist? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, if you go to your audiologist, what they will do is they will test your hearing and they will plot it on a graph. If we go across, from left to right, we go from lower pitches to higher pitches. If we go down, we go from really soft to really loud. And what they will do is they will go through and test each ear individually, and they'll go down and they'll put a mark at wherever you could just hear that sound. And pretty soon you have this little graph that goes across and tells you where your hearing loss is or your hearing is, as the case may be. What I want to talk about here is just the fact that it's across is pitch and up and down is loudness with louder at the bottom. So a dog barking is more in this area, jet plane is really loud, leaves rustling tends to be a lot softer. I'm going to breeze through this because this is pretty boring. Phonetics is the study of speech sounds and their production, transmission, and reception, and their analysis, classification, and transcription. There will be a test before the end of the session on what phonetics is. No, there will not be. So we're going to look at relative loudness of sounds, voiced versus non-voiced, pitch of the sound. We've already talked about that a little bit and the length of the sound, because it does make a difference. Relative loudness of speech sounds within the word. Not all sounds are created equally. So how loud is the sound compared to the other sounds in the word? Does it have voice with it or not? B versus P. Did everybody get that difference? Whether I use my, I did the same thing with my lips, but whether I use my voice or not. V versus F. The F didn't come through nearly as well as the V did. So it makes a difference. Vowels tend to all, well, they are all voiced and they tend to be more powerful. They tend to be stronger and carry your word. The pitch of the sound. In general, unvoiced sounds are higher pitched than voiced sounds. 
Higher pitch sounds add the clarity to discern the words. Square versus star. Two versus through. So if I say score two, it's possible that not all of you heard what I said or you weren't sure which one did I say. Did I say square through or did I say to square two? And I've heard callers use that. Square two is a shortcut way of saying square through two or something like that. It will make a difference. Sometimes it's helpful <laughs> to increase the treble in the microphone if the dancers are having trouble. And that's if your whole group of dancers are having trouble or if you're having echo problems and those kinds of things. It's always helpful to accentuate the non-voiced sounds when you can. Voiced would be b. Non-voiced would be p. Where I used my voice with it and then I did not use my voice with it. So the first one was a b, the second one was a p. And I'm adding for that because they're recording the session. Okay. And they're probably not going to hear the p very well on the recording. Absolutely proves my point. Or hopefully does. So some sounds are inherently short, b, k, t, g, those t types of sounds. Some sounds are inherently longer, m, n, and most vowels, which is why, and I'm not too sure I can do it without music, but John Jones absolutely loves the way that I cue maneuver because I tend to draw it out just a little bit to keep all of the sounds in there and it's full of those long sounds. The duration is sometimes dependent upon the word ahead of it or the word behind it as well. Okay. When we read, we do not see every letter or sound out every word. We read the entire word, phrase, or sentence as a unit. That is why we can read items that are misspelled or have missing characters and still understand the text. The more information in the text, in general, the more we can remove and still understand the material. We do that all the time. We read pretty fast. We go across things. How about when we listen? We also listen to speech as phrases or sentences. And we don't always need all of the sounds in order to piece those phrases or sentences back together. We just get the gist of what's going on. Sometimes we get a little lazy when we talk. I do too. And we tend to talk rapidly. We run our words together. We trail off at the ends of the words, and we don't always project all the way through the sentence. So what are some ways to improve that? Slow down your rate of speech. It's probably the number one thing I can say. If somebody, well, there's one a little bit later, but if somebody says, I didn't understand, or they can tell that they didn't, uh, you we're not communicating well with them auditorily, slow down your rate of speech. Don't yell at them. Keep a smile in your voice, but slow it down. If you're calling or cueing, you still have to stay with the rate of the music. Don't misunderstand me there. But my rate is typically slower when I'm cueing, or in this case, when I'm speaking to a group, than it is if you see me, you know, tonight and you just come up and start talking to me, I will probably talk a little bit faster. And that's to get the information out to you. We don't have that whole sentence when you're calling or cueing to communicate to the dancer. You may only have one word. You may only have a couple of words. And so it's important that we do our part 
to project out and finish each word before you start the next one whenever possible I couldn't find a really super good score dance call to do this with but scoot yeah I, I do that just naturally after 30 years of working with hearing impaired scoot walk to if you're round dancing and that's exactly how I cue it you hear the T on the end of scoot you hear the K in the middle of walk and that's just the way that I tend to do things because I've practiced so much and it does take practice it's not something that just happens oh we're back to the audiogram oh no I'm not going backwards Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, on the audiogram, there's this area here that's yellow, and you notice it has a bunch of letters in it, but those letters stand for sounds. So we have M for the M down here, U, those kinds of things, E. Once again, my vowels are down here and some of the consonants. But over here, this is the one I really want to pay attention to. If you can't see it, this is an S, this is an F, and this is a TH. Square through four. Those words all started with these sounds that are not as loud they're towards the top of the graph and they're over in the higher pitched region this whole yellow area is called our speech banana just because it tends to look kind of like a banana when we graph it so the colors didn't come through as well on this computer um, as they do on some of my other computers but this part is yellow green red and blue down here blue is where is beyond where I'm speaking in loudness yellow is the lower pitches green is the middle pitches and red is the higher pitches once again we're still at square through four over there oh my remember I graphed the person's hearing loss and then what I've done here is I've shaded it in not well but I've shaded it in that's gone isn't it that person cannot hear that it's really common for somebody with high-pitched hearing loss or high-frequency hearing loss to lose those sounds and then if we look at this how would I describe that well as an audiologist I'm gonna say that they have a slight loss down here and then it kinda of gets mild and we get down into the moderate level so the person comes in as a patient and they hear slight and they quit listening and even if they hear the mild part or the moderate part it's like eh, I'm not doing that bad I'll be one of the 80 percent I'm doing just fine but they really are still missing quite a bit then they come back a few years later and they have more loss because that's age was our number one reason and now we've missed more sounds so that's what happens that's the whole process to that is the fact that they lose those high-pitched sounds especially the ones that don't have any voice and it makes it different so then we get wonderful things like this if you can't see the bottom it's a bunch of cops and uh, eating and it says nice delivery John but I asked you to say grace not spray mace so I want to talk just a little bit about loudness I need to get going here and the fact that as sound passes through air especially in open air you will lose 75 percent of the sound every time you double the distance that's important it's not as 
relevant if you are in an enclosed space because it's reverberating back to you. But you, you know, remember that. If you're deciding whether or not to use the microphone, make announcements, those kinds of things. On the flip side of the coin, and this one I do want to talk about, some people will get bothered by loud sounds. Have you ever had anybody walk up to you and say, you are way too loud? Mm -hmm. There's something called the abnormal loudness growth. And this has to do mostly with people who have hearing loss in that inner ear, like what we talked about at the beginning. Remember I talked about if you just plug it, it's pretty steady. But if you go into the inner part of the ear, it's not so steady. So it may get louder as we go, but it may get too loud, too fast for them. And that's it all says that. I'm just paraphrasing it. Because this one will show it better. So they can't hear here, and then it's soft, and then we have this great big green area where it's comfortable, and then it's loud, too loud, and painful, and they have normal hearing. And then somebody else comes along who is hearing impaired, and they have this big area where they can't hear it. But then it's soft and comfortable, and you notice how small that green area is compared to this green area? And then it gets too loud, too fast, or faster for them, and even painful. So now they have this really compromised zone of comfort. That's part of the reason why you may be at a dance, especially a large function, and have someone walk up and say, we can't hear you, and the person right behind them says, you are too loud. Would you turn it down? And it's because the individual hearing is different. And it's not just when they detect the hearing, it's the fact that it gets louder faster for them also. Please take that information home with you. That's really important to try to remember that. It may not be the same on the two sides of the, of the ears. It may not be the same for different pitches. It all varies. So written text can be easy to read on a background without competition, or it can become difficult to discern as the background becomes more and more equal to the text. The same thing happens with background noise. Humans understand speech that is embedded in a background of noise much better if the speech is at least three decibels louder than the background noise. How much was three decibels? Twice as loud. So you need to be twice as loud as your background noise. That's just general statement. <laughs> because that's exactly where I'm where I'm headed, is that the calling or the commands need to be twice as loud as the music. Now, I don't call the music background noise. I call it voice-to-music ratio. Is that nicer? In turn, in an optimum environment, our music should be at least 3 dB louder than any environmental background sounds or noises. Sometimes that's impossible. It's just that's a fact of life. But I try most of the time. So this just shows the fact that it's pretty loud. It's 15 decibels coming out here, but we come down here, and it's already down to only 3 dB above this background noise, which is the dots going across there. So the first two students can sort of hear and understand, but the ones in the back are making paper airplanes. They're you know writing love notes. Nowadays they're probably on their cell phone, even though they're in kindergarten, and you know just having a good time. The same thing's going to happen with the dancers. If they're in the back of the hall or where or in a place where we have a lot of background noise and they can't hear, and that score is not being successful, they're not going to have a good time. It makes a difference. We've actually already talked about this. Let's see how fast 
we can go through this because we've already talked about voice to music and I've got some other more important things to do. If you can read it as fast as I talk about it, and by the way, I do love the wheel. I'm one of the cures that loves keeping my music under control with that little wheel. You can change it. So how do you monitor your voice to music? With your ear or with somebody out on the floor helping you or with the VU meters, the volume unit meters, which I also love. I'm sorry that they don't put them on the sets anymore. Well, that's a whole nother discussion. They're not all the same. What I find is I find what works in that hall at that dance and then I monitor myself all night and try to keep it at those levels all night. Or if I'm at a festival and I know that the caller is doing a good job and they're using a set with a VU meter, I'll stand over to the side and watch his VUs so that I try to match those when I go up on the stage. How often should we monitor our voice to music ratio according to Susan? Constantly. You better believe it. 100% of the time if you can, constantly. Don't just set the sound at the beginning of the dance and assume it's going to stay the same all night long because things fluctuate. The recording fluctuates, your background noise fluctuates, lots of things happen. So if a person obviously is having trouble understanding, whenever possible, don't repeat. Instead, rephrase. And for my purposes here, these are how we're going to de define those words. Repeat means to say again using exactly the same words. Rephrase means to say it again, but use different wording and or different words. So you can't do it so much while you're calling. You just, you just can't. But while you're instructing, you can. You can describe it a multitude of ways. And I did something much earlier in this session. It talked about one out of five, don't wear a hearing aid, 20%. 80%. I said it three different ways and still said the same thing. It's a fantastic teaching tool regardless, but it's also what will help the hearing impaired because they may have certain sounds that they're not hearing and either by rephrasing it so the words are in a different order, the sounds work with each other differently, or by using different words you can get through to the hearing impaired much better. So I cannot stress this enough. It doesn't matter if you're on the microphone. It doesn't matter if you're having dinner with your spouse. It doesn't matter. If you're talking with someone who's having trouble understanding, don't just repeat what you said. Even if they ask you to, rephrase it. And you guys already know all this kind of thing. So I'm not even going to do it for the tape. Hearing aids solve all the problems. So for 20% of the people, it's not an issue, right? Wrong. And why is it wrong? Restoring the audibility is not always the full answer. It helps but it's not always the full answer. I talked about the fact that sound gets distorted down inside of the ear sometimes. It gets distorted in the brain sometimes. So the, the hearing aids can help. They can bring it in, but you still have your auditory function within the person. And that's usually already compromised somewhat, more in some than in others. Some hearing aids are too helpful. I bet you didn't know that. Some of our newer technology are designed to increase the amplification of the human voice and reduce the background noise. So how do hearing aids do that? In general, they look at something that's a pretty solid state sound and they say, ah, they probably want to hear it, but not quite as well, like the fans running in the room or something like that. So they'll bring that down. 
and then they'll look at the human voice that goes up and down. Oh, there's a human. You know, that, that looks like a voice sound. I'll try to raise that up a little bit. And so they're automatically trying to do that, which is a really good thing. However, the hearing aid doesn't know whether the person wants to hear the caller or the person telling the joke in the back of the room. Both are human voices. And if you have a vocal on your music, it adds to the mix. And trust me, I use almost all vocals. So I'm just as guilty. It's not a guilty thing. It's a being aware of it type of a thing. So we as leaders need to make sure that we're putting out a good music-to-voice ratio compared to the background noise ratio. I'm actually considering those three things along the way. I think I've already made this clear. Don't misunderstand me. The 80% that are not wearing amplification are not necessarily on the right side of the tracks. The hearing aids are very, very helpful. And the newer the technology, the better. You just have to have an audiologist who understands as a dancer or a caller that you're in that kind of a competitive environment auditorily and know how to adjust the hearing aids or give you some opportunities to do that. So they really can be very, very good things. They just simply are not going to restore it to pre-hearing loss levels. Generally, because I get asked this question, the higher the price of the hearing aid within a practice, the better the technology. So if you go to ABC hearing aids and they have them at different prices, in general, the higher the price, the better the technology. But if you then go to DEF hearing aids across the street, those prices may not correlate with each other at all, other than how they're structured in general. Hearing enhancement, I'd like to just touch on that for a minute. If you're not familiar with it, there would be a transmitter up on the PA system, and the person would wear a device and go into a set of headphones or a little earpiece to be able to hear directly from the PA system. I'm a strong believer in hearing enhancement. Strong believer. So what happens is it's usually an FM system. There are more than one kind out there. You have the choice of whether you want to enhance the voice, the music, or both. If I have one dancer using it at the dance, I'll let them choose. What do you, you know, because they're hearing the things I'm not, I don't know what's best for them. But if I have a whole room or several dancers using it, I use both voice and music. First of all, we want them to dance to the music. If I have a good voice to music ratio, then that's coming out of the PA set as such, depending upon how you set it up. I always use the line out from the back, and I do use Hilton equipment. But that's because I want the person to have that full picture. And I very rarely get people that will come up and want only voice. But in full square dance situations, you may get that more than you do in the round dance type situation. So do be aware of that. Do what works for your group. There's no right or wrong. And you need to know how you're actually setting it up. If you're coming out of the fronts and you've got little turn knobs on, some of them do, some of them don't, to change what's coming out of it so that your voice and music are separate coming out, you may have most any ratio. If you're coming out of the back of a Hilton, I think it's the high impedance, the top jack. Anyway, I just plug it in. Then I've got the same voice music ratio as I'm putting through the PA set. But the big deal is you're taking what's coming out of the speaker and you're putting it directly in the ear. And you're avoiding the background noise. That's the number one point of the hearing enhancement. Couple of warnings. For most transmitters, you do not want to plug them into the speaker outlet. Yeah, it will, because you will have an impedance mismatch. Uh-huh. You want, mm -hmm, you want to do it on the line-out jack. 
The other thing is it does not help the quality of the calling or the cueing. So do be aware of that. Okay. Eh. I'm going to run through this quickly. Helping the dancers. These are just some tips that may or may not have already been talked about. Use a microphone whenever speaking to the group, especially when teaching or calling. You may have people that will say that they can hear you fine, but don't assume that. People will stand there and, and you'll say, can everybody hear me? And all the heads will go up and down because of pride. They don't want to say no. So don't assume that. When appropriate and possible, control the background noise. That's not always possible, and it may or may not always be appropriate. In those instances, you can bring your sound level up above the background noise. I've queued for almost 28 years. I've heard my peers do it. I have never asked a crowd to be quiet so the round dancers could hear. Because I like the fact that we've got enthusiasm in that hall. And I want to keep that enthusiasm and I don't want to dampen it. And my peers and I will argue about this. I'll just raise the volume. And we'll have a good time together. They'll eventually decide they can't hear each other on the side and they'll move out or they'll do whatever. But I'm there as a performer and I'm there to make it a wonderful experience for all of the dancers. So that's my personal opinion on that. I really only have about three minutes. I'm sorry. Use caution if playing background music when people are trying to talk to each other, like prior to a dance or at a break or something like that. If you want to do that, that's fine, but keep it at a low enough level that they're able to talk to each other. When instructing face the dancers, we already talked about that one. Use other forms of communication. Pick up a flyer and hold it in your hand while you're talking and trying to promote your event. Um, use hand gestures. Why do you think I brought a wireless mic with me? I didn't need it for any other reason on this trip. So that I had my hands to talk as well as control the other units. That is correct. However, most microphones only work the best if it's right in front of your mouth. Okay. So there's a whole session on microphones. So that would probably be a terrific place to go. There. I'm not putting you off. I'm just letting you know. And um, it would just how if you're interested in that, just take your microphone and talk to it and find out where the sweet spot is. So yes, you're right. We can't always do the best. Try to control the lighting. And again, we have talked about that. Other than if you have a, a bright light right behind you, then that also makes it difficult for them to read your lips. So sometimes we have to compromise. Get the dancer's attention before beginning to speak or teach. Sometimes that takes me a while when we're coming back off of a break at lessons. Monitor your ratios, speak clearly, provide the best sound possible, consider providing a hearing enhancement. So, the goal is to attempt to reduce these types of exchanges on the dance floor. And yes, this is a round dance cartoon. No, no, she said hover, not hug her. Okay? So she doesn't want to be hugged. She just wants to do the dance figure of a hover. In summary... It is probable that a large percentage of square dancers have hearing impairment significant enough to impact them while dancing. We went through all of those statistics. There are several things 
that we as dance leaders can do to help all dancers hear and understand us better. I thank you all very much for coming this afternoon, and I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. If anybody has questions, uh, and I can answer them while I'm packing, I have to pack so that they'll be ready for the next session. I'd be happy to stay for a few minutes. Thank you.